that is the most important thing that we should learn. We need to listen to the criticism that these are old, outdated texts that have no meaning today. The Bible and the Quran are manipulated in order to legitimate violence. Why are you happy? Hi everyone, welcome to Christ Alive and this is our second episode. So today we will be speaking about the Bible. We're going to learn all about how the Bible actually isn't daunting, actually isn't scary, actually isn't irrelevant. So um, if you're interested to hear how that turns Gosh. out, um, then join us. And our guest is Father David Neuhaus, who's a, a Jesuit who works lives. In, lives and works in Jerusalem, although he's been in South Africa for a little time. Where the Bible is set. Again, I am Gara Vrishaketsa Ramayla and I am with Sean Nicholas van Staden and Father David Mark Neuhaus. <laughs> <laughs> We're bringing in the middle names. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Father, for joining us. So, Father, just could you introduce yourself again, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. So, I am a Jesuit. I'm a Catholic priest. I am born in South Africa, moved when I was very young to Israel, have been living in Jerusalem for more than 40 years, where I teach the Bible. You teach the Bible. Why do you teach the Bible? <laughs> Why not accounting, maths, English, something? Why the Bible? Because I think that that is the most important thing that we should learn. Um, yeah, it's a strange expression to teach the Bible, but I think it's parallel to teaching English mm -hmm. because it's teaching a language that allows us to speak about God to speak about ourselves, and to speak about the relationship that we are called to with God. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways the Bible provides us with the syntax, the grammar, the vocabulary to do exactly that, to say God. I mean, it's a bit strange to be able to say anything about God. Mm -hmm. If we believe in God, we certainly believe that God is so great, so beyond our comprehension, that perhaps it would be best to remain silent. And I think the Bible is what allows us rather to be able to speak, to put words on God and our relationship with God. And by doing that, I think we understand a lot better who we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose it helps us to articulate our experience mm. of God or helps us to reflect on and then articulate our experience of God. And God's experience of us, mm. which is equally important. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think that the central character in the drama that is the Bible is God. Mm -hmm. And really being able to listen to how God describes God's self in our human lives. Mm. And I think in that we can then decline and conjugate ourselves as beings in relationship with God. Mm. So how, how did you get to that point? When did you decide that I want to teach the Bible? Or actually, mm -hmm. let's say, let me start from the beginning. When did your relationship with God begin? Okay, those are two very different questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I can say that until I was 15 years old, I didn't have any relationship with God at all. I was pretty convinced that if there was a God somewhere out there, I was not interested in God, and probably God was not interested in me either, and so there was a complete disconnect. Mm. I, at the age of 15, as a young Jewish South African boy, went to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, I encountered a person who convinced me without at all speaking about God or about the Bible, but who convinced me that God is here, God is now, God is acting. And so that was a very powerful experience that led me to rethink everything, mm. who I am, who God might be in my life, 
and what we're all doing here. So that happened at the age of 15. It took many, 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 many more years to get to the point where I was told under obedience, I said I'm a Jesuit priest, yes. which in some sense means that I don't do what I want, I do what I'm told, that I should go and study the Bible. That is something that I should do in order to serve the church and the world. So it wasn't really a choice. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I'll quickly add, before you feel too sorry for me, that I think it was the best thing that happened to me after meeting Christ. That, mm. that order by my religious superior that you should go and study the Bible mm. so that you can teach the Bible. Mm. Mm, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting to see kind of God at work in surprising ways in different yeah. areas throughout your life. I, I'm wondering if we should unpack all the different elements of the of the of the story like um maybe we can start with like where are you teaching scripture at the moment so for the last 23 years i have been teaching scripture predominantly in a seminary which means a place where young men are studying to be catholic priests in a little town next to bethlehem it sounds like a Christmas carol and we're in the Christmas <laughs> season, but that is precisely where I do teach scripture. Mm. It's called the Latin Patriarchal Seminary in Beit Jala. But beyond that, I've been teaching in many, many different places in the Holy Land. And as I've become more and more comfortable with the language, so I've been invited to teach in many different places as well. How come I'm here with you? Well. I asked for a year to come back to the country in which I was born. And so this has led to the wonderful experience of teaching the Bible also here in South Africa, encountering the South African experience, which I knew nothing about, mm. having left when I was very, very young and left behind a very different South Africa and a South Africa in which I didn't know God and probably didn't know myself either. Coming back after all those years and rediscovering the country of my birth and being able to teach the Bible here has been an absolutely magnificent experience. Mm. In a few days, I will be going back to resume my teaching in Jerusalem, but I'm very fortunate that the superiors have agreed that I can spend eight months doing that in Jerusalem and then return to South Africa every year for four months, mm. hopefully continuing to discover this wonderful country. Mm. Mm. One, one foot in Jerusalem, one foot in Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it must be so fascinating teaching scripture in the places where the story is set. You know, that must be amazing, you know, to be, you know, looking at the infancy narratives in Bethlehem. That mm -hmm. must be amazing. So we had a wonderful bishop for many, many years who wrote a pastoral letter about reading the Bible in the land of the Bible. Mm. And indeed, that's an absolutely unique experience. It's amazing to be able to go around and be able to identify the places that the Bible speaks about. And of course, it means a totally different experience of reading the Bible, mm. which I hope enriches my teaching wherever I go. Mm -hmm. So that even when I'm teaching people who have never been there, I can make the Bible come alive with the knowledge of the land in which the Bible came alive. Mm. So. Do you find that it does come to life more, you know, once you've maybe seen the Sea of Galilee? Or, uh... So it's interesting that you use that example, <laughs> <laughs> because I think that that is the best example that we have in so many other places. If we think of Jerusalem or Nazareth or Bethlehem or Naples or any of the towns that are mentioned in the Bible, it's hard to see what the places would have looked like in the narratives that the Bible is describing because there's been so much building and building over and we really have to excavate and go down, down, down into the depths of the earth to try and uncover what things would have looked like. But that's not true when you look at the Sea of Galilee. That's the wonderful mm. thing that when you look at the Sea of Galilee, you're looking at what Jesus looked at. Mm. And so, yes, that's one of my favorite places. Mm, wow. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever done an Ignatian contemplation, like sort of sitting next to it? Absolutely. Absolutely. A number of retreats, <laughs> mm. but also mm. been able, had the wonderful good fortune of having a group of students who were able to go and live next to the Sea of Galilee oh. and then study the narratives of the gospel right there. Mm. 
Wow. So again, it's a wonderful experience. But of course, it's not an experience that everyone can have. Mm. Yes. And so I think that we have the wonderful privilege as teachers of the Bible to try and bring alive the Bible. Mm. And of course, it's a two-pronged activity mm -hmm. because one is to try and understand what the text is saying, the text of the Bible, trying to read it. And I am very, very much focused on trying to bring alive every single word, that every single word has a meaning mm. and <clears throat> trying to understand what those words say. But the other side of this two-pronged activity is trying to actualize it in the life of the people who are doing that reading in circumstances which are completely different yeah. to the circumstances of the people writing the text or the initial people for whom the text was written. Mm. So this is the challenge understanding what the text says and understanding what it could mean for people today in our yeah. world confronted with that text. Mm -hmm. You know, now mentioning the people of today, I wanted to ask, with a country like South Africa, we, it has found that reading is not one of the favorite things that a lot of us actually like to do. Now telling people to actually read the Bible, that's another stretch. <laughs> so how do you... How do you teach people who are, I don't want to say not interested, but who, who find reading in general just difficult? So I think that the hook that can be thrown out in order to fish the people into the net of the experience of reading is, of course, storytelling. Mm. So that we're not really focusing first, first on the act of reading, but on, and this is also a challenge in our world, the ability to listen. Mm. and the ability to listen to a story in which they play a central part, the people who are listening. Mm. For we are dealing with, again, the central character in the Bible who is God, who is hungry for a relationship with us. We are created in order that God not be alone. Mm. And of course, we are created, each of us, so that everyone else won't be alone. <laughs> yes. So I think that it's the narrative, the narrative art of the Bible that can really attract people into the act of reading. And the act of reading is leveled because when we first approach it, there is the simple narrative. But there are so many levels as we start to appreciate that these are not just quickly written, quickly composed narratives that have been thrown together mm. in whichever way. They are carefully constructed. And again, I go back to the work that I love doing, and that is really looking at each word and the echoes of those words within the greater story. So wherever we are in the Bible, if we're reading a story about Abraham or a story about David or a story about Jesus, these stories are all connected in a kind of very, very intricate network of words of verbs. Mm. I tend very much to focus on verbs because it's when we encounter the verbs that we encounter God. Now, what does that mean? The first verb that we have in the Bible is God created the world. Mm. What does that verb mean? And in order to get to the depths of what it means, we need to know not only language, meaning in our case, we're speaking English, mm. Of course, the biblical languages are not English, so already there, there's a work to be done to reconstruct that word in its original languages, Hebrew and Greek. Mm -hmm. But then also, how does this word play out in this long, long series of texts that slowly uncover the meaning, the dynamism, and the relationship that is cultivated through the use of that verb? Mm -hmm. So again, you start with a story, and that is what entices people to come in. And then as you unpack the story, you're really reaching the level of language. And language is absolutely fascinating. Mm. So, And I'm also, I don't know if it's just me or my for you page, because you mentioned TikTok a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm finding on TikTok that there's a lot of, how do I put this? Um, a lot of people are trying, not, I don't want to say discredit the Bible, but they just want to say that it, whatever is in the Bible is either not true or unrealistic. Mm, or old and or irrelevant. old and mm. irrelevant. So how, because you say you love teaching it, 
how how do you bring that relevance to today? I think that we need to listen to the criticism that these are old, outdated texts that have no meaning today. Mm. Because let's face it, it's true. These texts were written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Yes. Okay, the oldest of them were probably written even a few thousand years ago. And so it is not completely coherent to say texts that were written hundreds of years ago by people we don't know who they were. Mm. They certainly were not of our culture and of our time. For an audience, the people they were writing for, who have nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. What on earth are we reading other people's mail for? Mm. It was written for other people, not for us. So I think that we need to take that challenge very seriously and not mm. poo-poo it and say, oh, stupid people, they don't understand what they're talking about. Yeah. They do understand what they're talking about. But here is where the marvel comes in where the marvel kicks in, and that is, as we listen closely, and again, yes, there is an effort to listen to what that text is making heard, we can slowly penetrate that text and realize how actual it is for us. And why? Because of relationship. Mm -hmm. I, really, I, I think that there is no human life possible without the attempt to build relationships. Um, Aristotle, another outdated old author from <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years ago, he said, we are social animals. Mm. And indeed, in the Bible, we have God looking at that human person that God created out of the earth, okay, that earthling, that earth creature, and saying, it is not good that this earth creature be alone. And immediately there we see, right at the beginning of the Bible, right at the beginning of the narrative, the concern of God for relationship. Mm. Not only relationship between the earthling and God, but that the earthling is in relationship. Now, when we speak in this way, I think that every person of every age can immediately recognize that there is something relevant here. Mm. Okay? Because once again, I mean, there is a certain art, I presume, of TikTok. I'm a dinosaur. I know nothing about TikTok. But the I've few been trying. <laughs> the few that I've watched really depend on a weaving together of words that can communicate a message in a very, very short space of time yes. that will ca catch you. Mm -hmm. It will take you, mm. even by surprise. And I think that, to a large extent, that's what the Bible is doing. It's carefully using language so that we can find ourselves, surprisingly, in these ancient texts mm -hmm. and identify our needs, our desires, our dreams, but of course in relationship. Because in that text, what is being described is also the needs, the desires, and the dreams of God for us. Yeah. It, it, it really becomes quite exciting, actually. I think when you think of scripture in this way, when when you look at scripture, you know, like how we how we probably grew up looking yeah. at it, this is this really boring, difficult to read text, you know, really confusing. But when you start to realize that these are people reflecting on their experience, trying to mm. communicate their experience of God and God trying to communicate God's experience of us, yeah. then you start to realize that can kind of cast a light on our own lives, our own experience, and you can start to kind of, as they were reflecting on their lives, we begin to reflect on oh, our nice. lives. And they reflect, what is God doing then? We start to see, ah, oh, what is God doing now in my life mm. and in our lives as a community as well? Yeah. No, that's, that's very Absolutely. true. That's mm. very Absolutely. true. Absolutely. And I think that there is a way that the Bible can be presented, which is indeed boring and complicated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would say that that's not the most useful way to present the Bible when we first encounter the Bible. The most useful way is to talk about what's the plot? What's going on? Mm. What, what, what is this all about? And then to realize that it's about us, our relationships among ourselves, but also this, this God who wants to come into our lives and is using as many strategies as God needs in order to enter into mm. our lives, to enter into that relationship and to enter into a conversation with us. Mm. And these are the stories that the Bible is telling. And there are so many of these wonderful characters in the Bible who reveal to ourselves who we really are. Mm -hmm. 
That's quite exciting. It's like God likes you. <laughs> <laughs> God wants to talk to you. God wants to be with you. you know? yeah. Um, yeah. For more information about the Jesuit Institute, visit our website at www.jesuitinstitute.org.za. You can also follow the Jesuit Institute on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I don't think maybe we could have this conversation with you saying that you teach in Israel and not mention how is it now with everything that's going on between Israel and Palestine and you teaching there? How are how are the challenges of actually being able to speak about God and his greatness and be in a space where there's something so scary and violent happening in the same breath? So, of course, that's the only context I've ever known. Yeah. This conflict has been mm. going on for more than 100 years. Mm. And it is an absolute catastrophe and a human tragedy. Mm. So, indeed, within that context, I'm looking also for answers. Answers to the question, what can I say? And, of course, answers to the question of, what am I supposed to do? Mm. Now, I have a very, very privileged position which is not common uh, for somebody living in that area, and that is that I speak both languages. I speak Hebrew and I speak Arabic. And more than speaking Hebrew and Arabic, I am working within a Hebrew-speaking milieu where I am teaching the Bible in Hebrew, mm. which, of course, is very interesting because a big part of the original language of the Bible is, is Hebrew. Hebrew. Perhaps not exactly the same level of Hebrew that we speak today, but still. Mm. Ah, it's it's very similar. And, of course, then teaching also in Arabic. And although none of the Bible is written in Arabic, Arabic is a very ancient language, and we are in deep relationship with another religion or the followers of another religion who believe that Arabic is a sacred language, and mm. that is, of course, the language of the Quran mm. and the language of Muslims. So first I want to say, before we get to anything scary or challenging, is the level of privilege, mm. of privilege which I didn't really choose, but my life developed in such a way that I was always among Hebrew speakers and Arabic speakers, and now am able to try to communicate something of the richness of the Bible in both of those languages. Yeah, there is a loss for words. Ah, when one contemplates what's going on, and of course what has been going on for the last more than two months, mm. uh, this present round of this conflict began on the 7th of October. We are now the 19th of December. Mm. We don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. I would say that the last few days have revealed some of the worst of what has been going on with, with senseless death mm. uh, on every side. Um, we come to the Bible with those questions. But I want to say that there is a huge challenge, and that is Within this conflict, the language that I am saying is so rich, so relational, is being manipulated by people who want to promote the conflict. Mm. They are not that interested in God. And I would say here the suffering of God as God witnesses what we do to one another. Mm. We are all God's children. That is an absolutely foundational message of the Bible. But people in the conflict have been manipulating the language in order to legitimate violence and justify their claim against their brothers and sisters who mm. live in the land. So it's tragic. And I would say that many people in the land who are suffering and crying out for, for help, they would say the Bible is not only boring and complicated, they would say the Bible is cruel mm. and heartless and part of this pitiless war that has been going on for so long. So this is a huge challenge as well, to make the Bible a text that speaks about relationship in this context. And there again, not just a relationship between any individual and God, but a relationship among us, that we can really understand that the Bible is a story of God's engagement with us in order to bring us together as brothers yeah. and sisters. Okay, again, I'd say that the most important character in the Bible is God, and God depicted as a parent God, a God who profoundly loves 
every single human person mm. who in the Bible is described as being created in God's image and likeness. By the way, many people say, well, what is that image and likeness? I say, <laughs> it means I look like my daddy. Mm. <laughs> it means like when I walk down the street, and this happened to me, this is a real story. I walked down the street many years ago with my late father. I had been living out of the country for decades, mm. and we bump into a friend of his who had never seen me before and looked at me and looked at him and looked at me and looked at him and said, this is your son. <laughs> wow. And I said, wow. And then he added, he's your image and likeness, mm. meaning I resembled physically my father. Mm. This is totally relational. Uh, this is a God who is the image and likeness of every child, woman, man, old person being killed in the conflict. And every time we're killing somebody, supposedly in the name of some religion or, or nationalism or ideology, mm -hmm. saying this is what God wants, God is weeping that a child of God has died. has died. And so again, this is a challenge in an, in an environment where the Bible and the Quran are, are manipulated in order to legitimate violence and the dispossession of the other. Mm. Mm. Wow. It really is yeah. quite tragic yeah. because I think the scriptures actually call us, you know, to that right relationship. And mm. I, I think those who are reflecting on the scriptures seriously and those who are trying to follow it, I think will have a different kind of way of living there. And I, I'm struck by your presence in that space and the presence of other Christians um, almost being a prophetic presence, a potentially prophetic presence. Um, the potentially oh. is very mm. important mm. because there are many texts in the Bible mm. that when we read them again, that first approach, they seem to be full of violence and mm. vengeance. The surface level reading is, well, may, may read like I that. I would say <laughs> the words, the literal the words. level mm. seems mm. to be there. And I would say that that's an important part of what the Bible is because the Bible is reflecting who we are. And we are vengeful and angry mm. and violent mm. and, and full of sorrow. So there's a level where the Bible is reflecting who we are. But again, as you said, we need to get down into the text. There are texts that are frightening. There are yeah. texts that both in, by the way, I want to state immediately, because many Christians will say, oh, yes, in the Old Testament, mm. in the first part of the Bible, before Jesus comes, there are texts that are violent and, and full of vengeance. No, 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 no. That only shows how little we know the New Testament. The most violent book in the, New Test in the whole Bible is a book in the New Testament, the book of the Apocalypse, the last book. It's full of rivers of blood and, and terrible violence. So violence is there, and violence needs to be there. This is not a fairy step. This is not a fairy, a fairy tale. tale. Mm -hmm. This is a true tale. And if it's true, telling our truth, then the violence and the bloodshed and the seeking for vengeance is all part of who we are. But again, we're on a journey in that text, and that journey must take us into the embrace of God. This is a parent God who is waiting for us to come home. It's apparent God, and this is also a problematic part of the text, that can know states of anger. Mm. There are descriptions in the old and on the new, and in the new, of the anger of God. But as one of the most important books in the whole Bible, the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament recalls in chapter 54, God's anger is not like our anger. It's a moment in God's mm. life, whereas God's mercy and love are God's overwhelming reality. So we don't need to say, oh, we're angry, so that comes from the devil. No, there is something true in anger. Even Jesus got mm. angry, okay? But I think mm. that where we're heading in our reality is towards a reality in which everything becomes love and mercy. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question, a personal question um, about what what's it like being you know Jewish and and Christian in the Palestinian areas, working in the largely you know Arab areas, and at the same time being you know an Arab speaker and someone who's often vocally in support of of Palestine in Israel, being an Israeli citizen at the same time. What's it like, kind of bringing those worlds together? 
So it's a challenge, but I think it's more a vocation. I feel that this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go over the wall that divides these two people, and it's the wall of enmity. There is a wonderful biblical text, again, one of my favorites, in the epistle to the Ephesians, which says, Christ is our peace. He brought down the wall of enmity. In his crucified body, he created the new human person. And in that new human person, there is no wall of division. So that's not my work, it's Christ's. And I try to be faithful to the witness of Christ's love for all. So going across, back and forth over the, the, the wall is a privilege and a vocation. Um, yeah, it's not always simple. It often leads to some suspicions. But I think that when I'm open and transparent about who I am, then people know what they're getting. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in the seminary, uh, the seminarians are very conscious of my, my uh, ethnic background. And, of course, my civil identity as an Israeli. <clears throat> and we joke about it and laugh about it. And I allow that to happen so that really we can have a real relationship and likewise, on the Israeli side, people know uh, that I'm a convert to Christianity, which often leads to a lot of suspicion. But when that's voiced, then relationships can be established that if you try to avoid that or run away from it, mm -hmm. it would be the elephant in the room that you're not talking about. So I feel at ease. I feel very much at ease passing from one side to the other mm -hmm. and recognizing that this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, in a certain sense, my vocation, my identity, and my mission. Mm. Your call, and in a way in which mm. God can work through you in some yeah. way. Hopefully, Hopefully. Uh, when I'm not too mm. much of an obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you. I want to ask, have you always taught the Bible? So, no. As I mentioned <laughs> to you, I started to teach the Bible because I was sent under mm. obedience to go and study the Bible and then came back and began to teach the Bible. And that happened when I was 38 years old. Okay. So now that I'm 87, I think. No, no. Now that I'm, <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm almost 62, I've been doing it for many, many years. So before that, of course, I was in formation as a Jesuit. Eight long years of formation, during which time I presume I was being observed so that the superiors could get a sense of who I was mm. and what I might do best to serve the mission of the Society of Jesus for the sake of the world and for the sake of the church. When I had my own choice, when I was able to do what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. I began university at the age of 17 and a half and did a BA, MA and PhD in political science. Oh. So that might tie up with your last question about the conflict and what's yeah. going on and my doctoral dissertation focused on one aspect of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, mm -hmm. between Jewish Israelis and Palestinian Arabs, and it looked closely at the use of religion in the conflict. So I feel there, once again, my story has developed in a way that has allowed me to perhaps mobilize some sense of understanding of where do I situate myself mm -hmm. and trying to reflect constantly on what does God want from me in this particular situation. Again, I think that the central word is relationship. Mm. Relationships are shattered. They're in ruin. There is devastation on the human level, not only on the material level. Mm. And in such a situation, how can one's reading of the word of God that is the Bible help? How can it be a force for rebuilding and big word uh, reconciliation but again remaining focused on that is certainly what animates me most of the time what what would you say to to a young person who i don't want to say who doesn't read the bible but who is trying to establish a relationship with god where should they start so i think that the biggest challenge uh, in our world today is noise. Mm. There is so much noise. We, we are listening constantly, and when not listening, just hearing 
an incredible degree of noise. And I think that the first step is really being able to struggle for those moments of silence. Because again, if the central verb in the human relationship with God is hearing, listening. So hearing meaning there is silence so that I can hear and then focusing, focusing in to listen to those voices, because probably in the beginning there are many voices, mm -hmm. and then slowly starting to discern which is the voice of the one who is looking for me, the one who loves me, who wants to build a relationship with me. I'd say that the first step is not diving into the Bible and trying to read, mm -hmm. but really having an experience of silence in which a thirst is born to hear the voice of the one looking for us. When that starts to become a reality, then is the moment that we can start, perhaps not alone, in other words, taking the Bible and saying, okay, here's the book, let me open and read it, because the Bible is a community book. Yeah. It's a book that we read in community. It's a book that we read with one another. And it doesn't make much sense when we just open it and try and read it by ourselves. So again, the first is the experience of silence so that we can start to hear and then listen to the voice that is coming through as the voice searching for us. And that's the voice that emerges from the community reading of the Bible. Listen, looking for the voice of the one who's searching for us or looking for the voice of the one who loves us, I find that to be a beautiful way of thinking about discernment. Mm. You know, there's all these voices in me. Which one, which is the one that's looking for me? <laughs> I've never really thought and about it And not that way. trying to take you over, mm. okay? If I was God, I would do things very differently. And I have a very definite sense that, and of course this is partly humoristic, God made a huge mistake when God just lets us mm. do what we want to do. God waits for us to turn towards God. And, you know, I'd say, well, march in, take over. All the other voices march in and try to take us over. They try to dominate us, occupy us, colonize us, imperialize us. God, and again, this is the image that comes out of the biblical texts, is infinitely patient. And I want to say, no, 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 no. I'll give you a kick in the pants. Get to work. <laughs> ah, but God waits until really we are ready to hear and then to listen and to focus in. And it's here where the Bible is the ultimate tool. Mm. We are not the people of the book. Okay, The book is not the central reality of our being. The book is an instrument. Mm. Ah, the book is there wherein we find God speaking to us. Central is Jesus. Uh, central is the face of God revealed in Jesus. But of course, we can't come to know Jesus unless we are one of those elect few that Jesus just drops into their lives mm. from out of the blue. And I'm not saying that that's, that doesn't happen or can't happen, but it certainly didn't happen to me. Mm. Okay, what happened to me is the meeting with somebody who was so full of joy and then when I asked her, that old uh, nun that I met in Jerusalem when I was 15, I said, why are you happy? Look <laughs> at the world. Look at your life. Her mm. life was miserable. She was crippled. She was old. She was a nun. She had passed through so many wars, lost so much of her family. I said, how can you be happy? And she said, I'm in love. Again, the relationship. And I said, oh, okay, she's completely mad. She's a 91-year-old <laughs> crippled nun, and she's telling me she's in love. And it took me some time to realize that she was talking about a profound, intimate relationship with one who had come to look for her, one who was speaking with her, one who had become a central reality in her life through whom she could see the world in colors, brilliant colors, that I couldn't see. And it was the desire to have that that led me to that search. And again, I probably wasn't even aware of how I'm laying it out now. The search for silence, the search for a place, a time where I could actually hear. And then listening to the one who was expressing love, 
saying, I want to be in relationship with you. Mm. And again, I think that the Bible is that instrument by which we discover of this relationship. It must have been such I a striking know. encounter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because that happened when you were about 15 or so? I was 15, 15 years 15 and you met this, this old nun. She was what and type of... And course, of course, what was amazing is she took me seriously. <laughs> I mean, I was a 15-year-old boy. By the way, I came to her saying I was writing the biography, 15 years old, <laughs> writing the biography of someone she had known mm. who had been murdered during the Russian Revolution. A, a Russian mm. royal, she, what, member of the Russian royal family? family yeah. yeah. And the fact that she took me seriously and we engaged in a three and a half hour conversation led by me. Nothing about God, nothing mm. about religion, nothing about faith. It all focused on this person who fascinated me. And it's only when I left her presence, I suddenly said, one second, that woman is the happiest, most radiant person I ever met. And I said, no. Nah. No, nah, can't be. <laughs> and I went back the next week and I said, Mother Barbara, I'm not here to talk about Grand Duchess Elizabeth. I have a burning question I want you to answer. Why are you happy? And of course, she was completely taken aback. <laughs> and knowing that I'm a 15-year-old Jewish boy, the last thing she wanted was to talk to me about her faith, about her inner life. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't let it go until she finally said, well, I'm in love. And I said, uh, what, what? I want that. Mm. I want that. I want to be animated by a relationship where I am loved. Sinner that I am, failure that I, that I am, the predominant reality becomes the one of being loved. And I think that's the story the Bible is telling from the first page to the last. I think that's what a lot of us are actually searching for is, is that love. But it's almost like we don't know where to find it or where mm -hmm. to look for it. Mm -hmm. So I think now in searching for that silence, we will be able to find that love, the love that God wants to give to us. And yeah. Because of Beautiful. course it means yeah. making place. Yeah. yeah making mm -hmm. place. Not being invaded and taken over, but really the act of saying, I am making place for another in my life. Mm. Am I ready to make place? place in the center of my being for God. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, medieval mystic called it, am I ready to become a mother of God? Meaning that God mm -hmm. will dwell in my innermost being. Mm -hmm. The next stage, of course, then is what she did without wanting to do it. She didn't seek to missionize me, yeah. but giving then uh, that God in, birth. in your mm -hmm. midst mm -hmm. to another. And that's the gift I received. And in teaching the Bible, I feel that that's what the gift I want to give. I mean, in uh, in response, what's happening in me is I'm reminded of what happened to me last week. We went to Zambia and I visited my novitiate, which is the first stage of Jesuit formation. And I sat in the novitiate chapel where I'd spent <laughs> many hours for the first two years of my Jesuit life um, praying and discerning. And I was feeling so emotional and mm. I didn't fully understand the emotion. It was just so much happening inside of me sitting there where I'd spent so many hours before. And I think that there were two things that came to my mind. One was this was a place where I made space. And I think mm. you, you spoke about that making space for God. So that was a kind of a privileged time in my life when I made a lot of space for God. And there was a big encounter with God that happened with me in that space. I kind of carved out this time in my life to just sit with God and um, a lot happened. And what happened, I think, was that relationship that you spoke about. So that encounter with God mm. and making space and having that encounter with God. And um, Yeah, it was it was it was beautiful. And I think to, today I still try and make that space. The space being more than just, you know, place and time, but really mm. actually making a space for God. And I think. I think that's a challenge. I almost want to ask you, how do you think young people can do this as well? Like, <laughs> can we can we do it as young people? Can we carve out a space? Not all of us can go off to Zambia and spend two years praying there. But how do we how do we do it? How do how do you what are you going to do? How how do you do it? I you know? think 
Mm. I think it comes with wanting to create the space. Mm -hmm. Actually making a conscious decision and say, this is something that I want to do. And I think tools will come according to what you need as an individual, but actually making a decision and say, this is what I want to do right now. Mm -hmm. That's how I think we can, we can make that space. Yeah. Because like Father was saying, there's just so much noise and so much information coming to you like, I don't know, at, at lightning speed because there's TikTok, there's Instagram, there's mm -hmm. Google, there's ENCA, there's Al Jazeera. There's WhatsApp status. There's WhatsApp. Yeah. So everyone is getting information from all these different sources, but actually making a conscious decision and say, this is what I want to do. I want to make this space. I actually want to listen to God. Mm. Then I think that's where it can mm. all begin. And then like, the other thing is like, how do we then understand that what happens in that space? I think that's where we almost need a bit of accompaniment, a bit of help sometimes, yes. you yes. know. So I make that space. Now, how do I understand and process all these voices? That I happen? think that's where the challenge is, actually mm. finding people or someone to uh, to journey with. Mm. I think that's why we decided to do this podcast, to actually find a group of people to journey with because mm -hmm. it is difficult to journey on your own. It's like deciding, it's like deciding to go on a diet, like, you can make a decision on your own, but actually sticking to it, you need someone to remind you, like, hey, this is what you said you want to do. So keep at it. Mm -hmm. So finding that group of people to journey with is the challenge because mm -hmm. we go to mass every Sunday or some people go to week every day, daily mass. But those relationships, like Father was saying, that we need to build those relationships, find those relationships. That's where the challenge is. Like, who do you go to? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes... Choosing to go to a priest is difficult because they feel like they're far away. It's like they're not in this reality. It's like they never started this journey at some mm. point. But finding a sister also, it's also challenging. But finding those everyday people that you encounter, deal with every single day and journeying with them, that's, yeah, that's the tricky part. And I think if you can find that, then I think the journey will be a lot less daunting mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's a bit I'm easier when saying. we're kind of walking together right? yeah <laughs> i think that speaks to the importance of friendship mm -hmm. the importance of good christian communities the importance yeah. of good christian leadership as well um and then of course the most important thing the importance of that personal encounter with god yes that that that's the thing that we're reflecting on mm -hmm. so all of that kind of needs to be happening together like i say with my with a lot of people that i encounter that I never saw myself in youth ministry at all. Anything that I'm doing now, I never saw myself <laughs> doing. And I ask myself every day, I'm like, why am I here? <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah. Am I even doing the right thing? Yeah. So every day is a question. And sometimes you, you don't even get the answers. But all I can say is I am happy with whatever it is that I'm doing. Beautiful. I want to just say that you said it would be less daunting if we found people to walk alongside mm -hmm. I'm going to be a little contrary and say it's not possible to do the journey alone. Mm. It's, it's more it's than just not, not daunting. It's, yeah, it's like it's, impossible without it. You absolutely wow. need. And again, uh, just looking at the second chapter of the Bible, God looks at you. You are now listening. And God says to you, it's not good that you're alone. Mm. I think, again, we must remember that God's plan for us is community, okay? Mm. The word for community in Greek is church. Mm. So again, ah, it doesn't necessarily mean the priest who's celebrating mass who might not be very relational, mm. but it means that we look around at this community and say, who can I journey with? Because we are not called to journey alone. Uh, God's relationship with us is this and this. It's we, we absolutely need uh, that companionship. So what is the good news? So asking a scripture scholar that <laughs> is always... Uh, oh, you called yourself a scripture scholar now. No, I said asking a scripture scholar. Now me as a teacher of the Bible. <laughs> so what is the good news? The good news is one word. One word. Mm -hmm. Resurrection. Okay. In a reality of death, it means that death is not the ultimate. Life is. 
That's the good news. Mm. This is the plan of God. God looks around and we look around and we see death everywhere. Mm. Okay, you just talked about Al Jazeera. I'm addicted now to Al Jazeera because yeah. of the images coming out of the land I love, the people I love, Gaza. Mm. And I say there's death everywhere. And I have to keep on reminding myself that the good news I am called to bear witness to is resurrection. Jesus really died, was really buried, and yet the tomb is empty. That's the good news. Thank you so much for joining us for another awesome episode with Father David Neuhaus. We hope to see you again soon for our third episode. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found that interesting, informative, and helped you as well in your mm -hmm. own kind of journey with God. See you next week. Bye.